Hello, homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today on the podcast, I got a little ingredient for you. Not communion, because, you know, it's obviously hard to pass the wine and the bread across the interwebs, but I have more than communion. Yeah. With Scott McDougal, buckle your theological safety belts. All right, before we jump into the podcast, I just want to tell you that I'll, in very few days, like a limited number of uh, spins on planet Earth, we will have shipped out Homebrewed Christianity Guide to Jesus, Lord, Liar, Lunatic, or Awesome. That's right. My first book from Fortress Press, Flying Solo, um, is headed your way. So if you pre-ordered it from Amazon, it would be arriving soon. If you pre-ordered it directly from moi on homebrewedguides.com, where you purchase the whole set for the cheapest price, cheaper than Amazon, free shipping, get a Theology Nerd card that you can swipe down, throw down right in front of your friends. You get a, a sticker, you get a high-gravity Christology class, and you get access to premium free streaming content. If you were wise enough to do that, then you'll be getting it first. Um, also, I'm going to be headed out talking about this, visiting some conferences, and in all of them, I want to see your beautiful face. So... Head on out and join me, Adam. That's right. So November 1st, I'll be preaching in Oklahoma City because the very next day I'm doing the uh, first of the book release parties right there, Oklahoma City at Tapworks. Then the next night, November 2nd, in Tulsa, Oklahoma, I'm going to get to see my friends from Phillips Theological Seminary, one of the greatest partners of the Homebrewed Christianity Podcast. They're even sponsoring the live podcast at the American Academy of Religion at the end of November with Yergi. That's right. You know, Multi, Yergi Multi, Jurgen Moltmann, Boom Shakalaka. Then the next day, that Wednesday, um, November 4th, I'm doing a one day theology nerd boot camp with Jack Caputo. Uh, you should, uh, you should come. It's going to be great. And we're doing it in Springfield, Missouri at Brentwood Christian Church. Then it's the birth of norm time. Boom, November 5th to 7th, I'm talking. There's going to be a live podcast. There's going to be some specially released homebrew Christianity-themed beverages. Yeah. And then after that, on the 12th to 14th of November, here in Redondo Beach at the Hatchery L.A., uh, we have Enfolding Spirituality with Rob Bell, Don Beck, Pamela Wilhelm, Steve McIntosh, Leslie Hirschbinger, Teresa Pasquale, Doug King, me, Max Johnson, Holly Roach, and Barry Taylor all hanging out. Yeah. Just saying that at the end of the month, November 20th, streaming and junk on the internet. All you ever wanted, Jurgen Moltmann. Mm -hmm. All right, so here's Scott McDougall. More Than Communion is the name of the book we talk about. It's a big one. It's a thick one. It's hardback from TNT Clark. You may want to tell your library to get it. Um, because we want them to sell enough of it that then it goes into paperback, then you can afford it uh, for your own home library. Thank you so, 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 so much for listening. Um, I know you're so excited. Like, the, your intensity just inspired the alarms to go off. If you're hearing them, it's not in your car. <laughs> it's uh, They're right outside my door. All that noise is happening right next to me. Anyway, homebrewedchristianity.com, at Trip Fuller on Twitter. Share the brew. And that means sharing this podcast with your friends. Yeah. All right. Talk to you later. Hello, Homebrewed Christianity listeners. This is Trip, and today is Scott McDougal. Uh, and he is over in Berkeley this morning. And um, it is very good to have you on. We're going to talk about more than communion and uh, imagining an eschatological ecclesiology from TNT Clark Theology. Um, this is a very intense book because it's one of the thick ones with very thick binding. Um, you know, I mean, it's not a Bible, but it could be the Hebrew Bible. Uh, it's about that thick, and you could really take someone out with it. Um, it's also a, a dense treatise, and he manages uh, to critique some of my favorite people to critique um, Milbank, um, and evangelicals that get really into Eastern Orthodoxy, they, that is always irritating. It's like, oh, I'm not a fundamentalist anymore. I read the early church fathers, and I'm fundamentalist about them. Um, 
but also he engages uh, eschatological theologians, uh, eschatological shape of Christian language and what it means to impact the church's understanding of its mission, its identity. Uh, and, and the other part about it is like it's, it's actual, uh, uh, actual theology about the church, not a pop kind of organization theory applied to the church or pop psychology applied to the church or really hip analysis of millennials and the nons applied to the church. Uh, it's an ecclesiology based on God's self-testimony in the person, ministry, death, and resurrection of Jesus. So uh, um, I don't know why you did this, Scott. You're not supposed <laughs> to write ecclesiologies these days, <laughs> let alone one so distinctively Christian. But before we get into it, I want to know how you ended up uh, a theologian. Well, I was, first of all, it's really great to be here. Thank you very much for having me on Homebrew. I've been a fan and a deacon for a long time. That's so what really, I like to hear. <laughs> it's really an honor to be here. Um, I feel like I'm in really good company. So thank you. Um, my, I, I, be, I was raised as a United Methodist um, mm-hmm. in central New York, and that was a very important component of my life growing up. Um, when I got into high school, I started to have some serious questions that I felt were I was having trouble finding good answers to. And so I moved away from the church for, for a while and sort of took an academic bent where I started to look at things like comparative mythology and comparative religion, um, Jungian psychology. Little did bit you of, tear up during um, like Joseph Campbell's special? I did. Bill Moyers? I, was, I was one of those people. Who oh, teared I can up see it. I can see it. Power. Yeah. Um, and, and uh, it took me a bit of time, but I did circle back. I came, I came back to the, to, in, to, into Christianity proper via um, the friends. Actually, I was a, I was a Quaker in Chicago for about a year and, um, and when I moved back to New York City, uh, I uh, very briefly maintained a relationship with the, uh, the Quaker community in Brooklyn. Um, but I felt that I needed something um, in terms of my own, my own sense of ecclesiology, actually, though I wouldn't have said so at the time. I needed something that was a little bit more liturgically rich uh, than... Um, than the friends were affording me. And the Episcopal church was one that had always been attractive to me. Um, and the first time after doing some serious reading on, on the background of Anglicanism, the first time I went to an Episcopal church, that was it for me. And I never left. Mm-hmm. And um, within a year I was, um, I was, uh, going through the formation process to be uh, received as a member of that church and that communion. And within a couple of years, I was on my way to seminary to start studying theology in a, in a, um, in a very intentional way with the express goal of working on ecclesiology. And the reason for that, for me as a, as a young Anglican was the fact that the Anglican communion as a, as a body, a family of churches around the world um, was experiencing great ecclesiological upheaval over first the ordination of women, which predated my involvement with the Anglican communion, but reverberating out from that, the new trouble that it was facing in the early part of the 21st century with the ordination of Jean Robinson as the first openly gay bishop. So there were great ecclesiological quandaries to parse out in the Anglican communion. And I felt that because I had been attracted into the Episcopal church and to the wider Anglican communion be precisely because of the kind of church that the Episcopal church and the Anglican communion as a family of churches are, that that would be the place where I would focus my theological energies. And that's the, the way in which my personal biography, it's sort of the way in which my personal biography and my theological work have started to con- have connected mm-hmm. at that nexus. Yeah, what I found interesting about the ecclesiology concerns, especially when it comes to kind of church unity or relationship between um, kind of Western churches and then uh, the part of a denomination or conglomeration of churches that aren't in the West, um, uh, is how much uh, those situations or times you find out we might just be more Western than we are Christian, in a sense, right? Because... Uh, all of a sudden you find different allies uh, 
uh, allies with people that you would have had huge differences for for theological reasons that are technically, I guess, big deals if you're a Christian, Mm -hmm. Um, either uh, your understanding of the Eucharist, uh, Mm -hmm. the role and function of the sacraments in the Christian uh, life, uh, your Mm -hmm. understanding of, like, atonement or the Trinity or Mm -hmm. these kinds of things. All of a sudden, you have allies between conservative Catholics and uh, and, uh, progressive UCCers uh, that set Western ones against uh, uh, non-Western Christians. Um, and ironically, uh, the world of non-Westerners is a lot closer to uh, the, the, the dominant kind of world pictures that uh, shape the authors of Scripture. So, so uh, wise, yeah. Yeah, but, so how does someone who, who uh, reconnects with the church via the friends, uh, uh, Methodist background, become an Anglican who cares about this? Right, like I know lots of Anglicans who don't care about this, and they're professional theologians. You know, not like okay, not care, but like everyone wants the church to be together, especially if the ones that aren't together with them then agree with them. Like, right? Um, but like, how does church unity and stuff like that become an issue for someone who's reengaging and reconnecting to the church? I think for me, part of the answer to that question lies in the fact that what I take church to be for. And one of the things that, quite frankly, in my, in my formative years wasn't working for me was the sense, the, the, the sense of connection, um, both to one another inside of our church um, congregation, but then to the wider world. Mm-hmm. And that could have been youth that I didn't perceive the connections that were there. But I also felt as if there was a a spiritual link by which I mean the presence of the Holy Spirit in gathering the community, the local community as a um, component Mm -hmm. of the worldwide global community of Christianity that was not on the radar screen of most of the people that I was worshiping with. I think that as a global communion, um, those who wish to be, aware of the fact that uh, the Episcopal Church is deeply and historically and theologically and practically connected to their brothers and sisters around the world was a, was a, um, a way of affirming and recapturing something that I thought was missing. In addition, it, that also connects to what you were just saying about the fissures that exist within Christianity globally because of various alignments and realignments. Um, I certainly am not alone in, and I would agree with theologians, particularly ecumenical theologians that find denominal breaks to, to denominational breaks to be much less compelling in terms of where our ecumenical work needs to take place than certain theological and political breaks within our denominations. Mm-hmm. As you say, you know, Conservative evangelicals, conservative Roman Catholics tend to find a common cause in ways that are surprising, given the rhetoric around the Reformation, say, that, um, that, um, that, that uh, is much more compelling and much more intractable in some ways on the, in, in the 21st century than the denominational affiliations themselves. Yeah. And, and I think that Anglicanism has resources for mitigating some of that, particularly at the ecclesiological level, particularly around a lived sense of relationality when Anglicanism is at its best. And and that is what um, really attracted me to, to, to immerse myself in this particular area of theological investigation. And I think it's also one of the things that made studying at a Jesuit institution for my PhD so attractive, mm-hmm. um, that it was a, 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 it comes out of a tradition that shares great affinities with my own, but is different enough that allows me to get some critical purchase on my own tradition mm-hmm. and that shares some of the theological presuppositions of my own regarding um, the Eucharist, for instance, as, a, as an example, um, commitment to social justice as an example. And that also is a global uh, Christian reality that's highly diverse. And that is an example of how a global, highly diverse um, communion of Christians 
remains in family relationship but in a different way than Anglicans do because of mm-hmm. the, 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 the church polities of Anglicans and Roman Catholics is, is quite different. In many ways, the Anglicans are more similar to the, to the Orthodox than to the Roman yeah. Catholic in terms of a, the way that the global churches are constellated. So those similarities and differences provided a, 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 a very helpful occasion for me to get very intentional about what it is that Anglicanism offers in terms of a vision of church, mm-hmm. both at the local level and at the global level that allowed me to, that has allowed me to, yeah. to take up some of this work in ways that I, I wouldn't have otherwise, I don't think. And, and, and if people aren't completely aware of just all the different kind of tensions that exist, like one of them is it, like the uh, ordination uh, of Gene Robinson, but also, right. um, gay and lesbian transgender folk in general whether yeah. uh they can be ordained be members serve communion um if you're on in an actual church it tends to be can they do sunday school before yeah. any of that uh and um in the anglican communion like the decisions made by the episcopal church in the united states aren't upheld right by everyone in the communion Correct. so now you'll have situations where in the united states there are churches that aren't episcopal connect to the american side they're, you know, maybe oversaw by a bishop from Africa or elsewhere uh, who are holding the, uh, you know, quote, like biblical traditional line on marriage or uh, right. same sex relationships or what. That's right. Or, or women. Um, That's right. So uh, w- what I find um, kind of perplexing about it and and thinking of it in your biography, the book makes a lot more sense. Like, you know, on, on that, you have like this kind of if you're like kind of, well, you're in Berkeley, so this shouldn't be surprising. You know, like you have this progressive instinct where you're just like, look, let me tell you, senor, what's the problem? And, it, <laughs> you know, and you don't realize just how like Western arrogant prick you're sounding. You're like, all yeah. right, the enlightened church led by the overeducated uh, empire, um, semi guilty, repentant feeling ones would like to now tell you. What's the true answer? When you evolve, you'll agree with us, and this is what you're going to believe, right? Mm-hmm. And you're you're telling them they have to do this and that, and um, and it, it's definitely a hierarchical, patriarchal, a domineering type vision of power, even if yes. it's more open and affirming in from our right. perspective. But then on the other side, uh, the ability for them to even identify you as sharing the same communion, the the same Christian mission and vocation, like if you just didn't talk about body parts, right, for Gene Robinson, yeah. and just right. knew anyone he served in congregations. And I've, I've met them. I've heard from him. Some of them not even fans of his uh, sexual orientation. But if you ask them, like, was he a good minister, then the answer is yes, and they'll right. tell you stories. So, like, I feel uh, uh, that it's common, right, when something like this to then go, well, let's just go to the table. Let's go to the yeah. Eucharist. And you, your book's like, that's good, but it's more than that. Yes. Uh, so can you yes. kind of talk about, one, who are, what is this turn to the Eucharist? Especially for people like me that grew up Baptist. We're like, yeah, we have a special meeting once a quarter, and some people do it. <laughs> Jesus said, do this in remembrance of me, not do me. Yes. And all you crazy hocus-pocus incensors. <laughs> and now you're, like, telling us that this, along with Nicaea, is going to bring people together. Um, yes. Like, that's how free church people tend to hear this. So... <laughs> <laughs> Can you, one, say, like, why theologians are actually running around saying, let's do communion more, and this is a big deal? Yes. And then why why more? Yes. Um, it, and the more is not I, the creed, because that, that I'll have to end. <laughs> I, will, I will do my best to avoid this. All right. No hypostatic um, unions today. Oh, no hypostatic unions. <laughs> um, in terms of how we are understanding the church, particularly coming out of the ecumenical movement, the reigning sort of model for how we are starting to understand or how the World Council of Churches and other, and other bodies are trying to understand what it is we're doing when we do Christian community, the idea of communion ecclesiology is what comes to the forefront. And what they're getting at with that is twofold. One, it's a communion with each other, but two, and very importantly, it's a communion of the churches in the body of Christ as the body of Christ. So it's got a horizontal dimension and it's got a vertical mm-hmm. dimension. And that this gets concretized and expressed, practiced in 
the celebration of the Lord's Supper in Eucharist. And so, and, and what this does is it takes up themes from the Pauline New Testament having to do with koinonia, communion, mm-hmm. and what that means, though there's contestation over what that term actually meant to Paul and continues to mean um, in terms of the way we construe that theologically, even as biblical scholars. But the way in which communion ecclesiology has been used, above all by people like um, Tiard and John Zizioulas and the World Council of Churches, is as a way to say, in communion, in, in both the sacramental sense and the sociological sense, or the, fel- the sense of fellowship, we have an ecumenism. We are one. We are united in this um, participation as diverse members of the body of Christ, very, and very much that Pauline metaphor mm-hmm. of the churches all being um, not necessarily being reduced to functions the way Paul talks about eyes and hands and private members and those kinds of things, but that we are all equally members of a larger body. It's a very organic metaphor. And this is all sounds terrific. It's, it's, and it is, it's a, it's a wonderful um, organic. It tends to also be an egalitarian um, construal of the way in which uh, the church can be understood. I think Tiard want as as a as a proto as, as a as a prime ecumenist mm-hmm. wanted it to to look much like that. But because it's and this gets directly, we're starting to approach the question you've just asked me. It starts to get deployed, however, in a hierarchical way, where communion in the body of Christ seems to, by definition, require a head. Right? And the head of that body is Christ. We all are, are very clear that that's the case. But who is Christ in the ecclesial context? Who is Christ in the, in, the, in, the, in the church and for the church? Some will say it's the Bishop of Rome. It's the Pope. I mean, just generally speaking, even many of the Orthodox are opposed in principle to uh, asserting the headship of the Bishop of Rome as the as the unifier of, of the Christian world. What about uh, Trinity Street, Wall Street's endowment? In what sense? It, you know, they own Wall Street and make lots of money off the... Anyway, I meant like the head of the church. Like, there's that sense that uh, when one group has so much money to affect right. uh, charity, justice work, advocacy, support for other things... Um, that's right. That, that was actually one of the issues Paul was dealing with in his letters, right? Like That's right. Jerusalem Church is saying, Paul's not really Christian. We'll update you join teams, Jews and Jesus, and following him around, telling, finishing the gospel preaching for him. And he's That's collecting exactly money right. for the poor in Jerusalem and taunting the Corinth church for not actually recognizing the, the shared body of Christ that these people that are theologically opponents. Right. So, right. I mean, I, it's so amazing. Like when you brought up the Koinonia thing, I thought, oh, that's one of the ways Paul uses it is yeah. actually in the way wealth was distributed among the body of Christ. That's right. And for and for many people who are who are beginning to critique this concept of communion ecclesiology, they're taking up that definition of koinonia as fellowship and as fellow sharing in terms of financial and material resources as the better understanding of what communion actually intends and not this, not to be pejorative in the use of this language, though it could sound that way, mystical communion in the body of Christ um, as what Paul was actually talking about. And so there's a critique coming from some folks around the notion of communion ecclesiology that's become the reigning paradigm for thinking about the church theologically that we've misconstrued what Paul meant by communion as some kind of um, amalgamation or melding of the churches into an ur church, an over church, a super church, which is not what Paul was talking about. He was talking about the Macedonian church helping their brothers and sisters in Jerusalem financially as an expression of God's gift of redemption, life, and salvation mm-hmm. through Jesus Christ, and that that sharing across those geographic and sociopolitical divides was what affects communion in the real and true sense, which is why it's a worldly reality. Communion ecclesiologies tend to abstract the church from the world to a certain extent, to greater or lesser extents, 
and leave that component sidelined, which is another one of my arguments in, mm-hmm. in this book, right? So, so that there is a sense in which communion isn't, which is why the book is called More Than Communion, that communion ecclesiologies aren't as rich as they might be have, if we were to have a deeper, richer, more fleshed out notion of what that communion consists of. And in the Anglican communion and in the wider Christian world, I think that that communion is an eschatological reality. Yeah. And that's the, the heart, the, 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 the sort of the cornerstone, not only of this book, but of my entire theological approach. Yeah, and, and part of that you kind of parse out by differentiating the church, the kingdom of God, the phrases yeah. you use for them and stuff. So maybe you can say a bit about that. Um, uh, in that section, I thought of uh, Ponenberg's Theology and the Kingdom of God, yeah. uh, which is one of my favorite books. And um, but but I do think it's helpful. That's one way of capturing just what it's like when the church is framed uh, eschatologically, which is odd, right? Given that all the early church was eschatological, and um, okay, well, unless we yeah. date the Gospel of Thomas super early and get rid of everything that got in canon, uh, think Paul is an aberration and all sorts of other stuff. But barring right. that. Um, <laughs> <laughs> eschatology centered the church. So um, that's right. Uh, how do you how do how in uh, uh, picking up these terms where the church has become the dominant image for so many people and the kingdom of God has become a social agenda or heaven? Like how do you re relate and kind of expose us to the more eschatological understanding of both? I think, like Pannenberg and like Jürgen Moltmann, I think that what is be what what they are claiming. And I think what is salutary for the church to recapture for itself is the sense that the kingdom of God is more than a personal heaven on the one hand, though it doesn't exclude this. It's more than a social program on the other hand, though it doesn't exclude this. It is a complete cosmic consummation of the true communion. What I use as a short, I call as a shorthand, the fourfold communion that communion ecclesiology at its best is really all about the communion of human beings with one another in the communion of the church, the communion of human beings inside themselves with ourselves so that we are integrated human beings, creations of God and God's image and um, communion between humanity and the rest of creation and the cosmos so that we are stewards of that creation and we are agents of that creation and God's agents in it. And then, of course, above all, communion between humanity and humanity's creator, between humanity and God. So that that fourfold relational reality that is true, thoroughgoing communion clearly is not a present reality. That's an eschatological reality that's larger than this notion of the kingdom of God, though it includes it. It's larger than the church, though it includes it. It is the um, it, it is the indescribable reality that occurs that we use all of our eschatological imagery to try to point to the new heaven and the new earth, the not yet that is also somehow now the, um, the wonderful images from Isaiah about peace and concord, as well as the social imperatives of the gospel, right? The images that Jesus uses to talk about social justice and uh, caring for the widow and the orphan, feeding the hungry, the Matthew 25 material, right? That this is, this is what communion looks like. It's a relational reality and it's a multi-directional, multi-faceted relational reality that just on an empirical level, we know is not here, but we glimpse it when it appears in our present reality through the relationships that we engage in. And those happen inside the church and outside the church. God is at work in those relationships through the presence of the spirit in creating that very eschatological communion that we see provisionally happening around us. And that's why Ponenberg, I think, and Moltmann are so helpful in parsing out an imagination of all of this because they're trying to, to help us see that the kingdom of God, even on, even in a, uh, as Jesus used this term to the extent that we can recapture this in Jesus own language, 
was a pro, is a proleptic reality for it's a it's a it's something that happens to us in the present, but only partially and under the conditions of sin infinitude, so that we always do this in a broken way. We always do this in a way that means we're going to fail. We always do this in a way that involves deep risk, but that's pointing toward this relate this deep relational reality that we hope and trust and believe in the promise of God is coming. And so the church's role is to be the place where that relationality, that communion gets practiced, envisioned, and embodied in and for the world, for us and for the world that we are um, disciples of Jesus Christ in order to bring into the world on Jesus' behalf and to call people into on Jesus' behalf. So yeah, that in the that kingdom is the is the kingdom that's being spoken of, I think. Yeah, and, and and you emphasize this in the book that the like the goal is not the church. No. Right? Like God did not desire to give the church to the world. God Correct. desired to give God's self to the world. Right. And uh the kingdom of God is the image of that giving of the divine life in the ministry of Jesus. Um and the church has other images in scripture. Paul has different ones. Um, that's right. but that uh one of the things that I like, I agree with it eschatologically, theologically, that I, I'll start resonating with it. And then I think to myself, there might be two people of the 800 people at my church that will one care, and then one of them might understand this. And I think this too about people that are all in, in the, the ecumenical movement. Like, I, and, and I'm, some of my friends are going to listen to this, and they, that are, I'm about to describe, like Baptists. <laughs> Baptists that are obsessed with, like, affirming creeds. Like, yeah. I don't care if you believe the creed or not. I don't even know what the hell that means. But I, 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 it's weird to me. You may as well switch teams. But, you know, like, you like to live in Boston and you're a Yankees fan. It's all good. Uh, but, like, no Baptist is sitting around. Like, you're not going to go into a church and be like, oh, you know, the historic creed, it puts us in union with all the blah, blah 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 like when we use a threefold formula at baptism and like you're like what what what's going like the the church as it knows itself on the ground is their self understanding so not theological at all the right. idea when either these like let's all have the ecumenical movement let's go down to the creeds communion everyone welcomes each other Yep. Uh, any baptism with the Trinity on it counts. Like, no one cares. They want it. The baby dedication, baptism, parents don't care. And that's just true for 95% of them. They'll lie to you ministers unless they think they're allowed to tell you the truth. They don't care. They just don't. They like Jesus and love and God and prayer, and they don't want to be scared to death. They want their kids not to use drugs. Right. Um, they think the world's better if you are, like, helping others. That's yes. about it. I don't disagree uh-huh. with them. I think those are fruits of it's, I'm just saying, like, if you and Milbank were sitting down with most people in a church, and Milbank's just, you know, being a dick and all that he normally is, but articulating his, his thing, he's like, rah, rah, rah. And then you're like, well, you know, but the more, blah, blah, blah. But I have this feeling that you're going to get a, huh? <laughs> what? Why does this matter? John and Scott, why don't y'all go over there? Y'all are our special members of the church, the ones that like to argue and read books. Um, maybe when you get done, y'all could write a prayer and we'll use it on World Communion Sunday. And then you I, and John are in the you, corner. You are absolutely right. You're absolutely right. They would say exactly that. And, and, and that's okay. And I think that that's, that is true. And I think in many respects, that's on us as theologians. And I think that for me is the reason why the back end of the book, um, mm-hmm. is the turn to practice. And, and well, but don't uh, just it's not just theologians it's ministers yes and, and uh, sometimes when people say theologians they mean the theologians that Academic teach your theology theolo- class i've taught theology class enough to know that there's really high quality theology getting taught in the classes and the students grow up in churches that know their congregants don't care um they're joining the church probably because they uh, they want to serve the role that already exists and they may not care to be reflective about these things. And if they do, they know it's only for a few people because they like pensions. So right. I think the it's not just the theologians, it's the church's vocation of theology, which includes lay members, Absolutely. ministers, and professional theologians. 
Um, but it's, it's like a, a someone who never thought, maybe I'm acting like my parents and that's not good. And, that's right. and their partner and their marriage are like, hey, hi, father-in-law. And you're like, no, what are you talking about? I'm just being me. You be you, I be me, and we'll never grow or relate better whatsoever because I'm going to be unreflective about anything about my past, my location, and my identity. Like, yes. I feel like that's the bigger issue, and it's the church's theology issue. Um, and we like to outsource things. I agree with you. And, I, and this is where I um, am really, I feel really resonant with the project that Jamie Smith is involved in with his cultural liturgies project, mm-hmm. which are the, the two first books, Desiring the Kingdom and Imagining the Kingdom. What he's talking about there is starting to create in a practical way, in, a, in an embodied way, in real communities of non-trained theologians, but just your... Um, your your um, average in a non pejorative way, but your 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 average everyday human being who seeking to do the best they can as a follower of Christ wants to um, do that in a way that gives life to her own life and to the world that for Smith that is the key to this is creating the proper desires and that that desire is for the world to look more rather than less like what we take to be the kingdom of God, Mm -hmm. meaning that we're looking for and then trying to anticipate through our everyday practices, a world of heart of justice, right relationship, the kind of reflection that you're saying is so missing. I couldn't agree with you more is the case, a critique of consumer capitalism, a critique of white privilege, a critique of the, though I'm not sure he actually says that, but a critique of, of um, the messages that popular media sends our way in a never ending barrage. And we mm-hmm. take it unquestioningly so that what we're focused on when we're desiring and imagining the kingdom is the relational reality of Matthew 25, right, where we're feeding the hungry and clothing the naked and visiting those who are in prison in all of the ways that takes place, you know, inside and outside of our own little lives. There's also the bigger picture of the globe. Um, And that begins by discussion, conversation from person to person around a, a table, which is why on a concrete level, as an Anglican, I contrast the what's called the Indaba process to this top-down process of issuing ecclesial statements about the way the church should be, right? So that we, instead of having people tell us the way the church should be, at all levels of the church, around the globe, we get together, read the Bible together, and talk to one another, start uh, having relationships with one another on a one-to-one embodied um, level where we're talking about the way the church could be so that stereotypes between, you know, Western educated theologians and um, people who get easily demonized in the third world as fundamentalist, for, for example, those things begin to break down and people are changed as a result of those encounters. And it's those embodied, uh, relational moments of true encounter with the other person that that communion starts to come into reality. The not yet starts to become the now. And that's what's going to transform an es- into an eschatological ecclesiology, though that, that those words may never be used to describe that. But a sense that the, that, that the church And our place in it is greater than we could imagine and more mysterious than we could imagine and richer than we could imagine. Just like our relationships to our spouses and our children and our students is richer than we could ever have imagined if we really entered deeply into them. That's the relational reality of the, of the, uh, the eschatological communion beginning to glimmer forth, even though it's always going to be shot through with sin, even though it's always going to be shot through with failure, we can nevertheless open to new ways of being together as Christians that bring these heavy, uh, theologically 
dense concepts into the into the cellular into the cellular level of mm-hmm. real Christian people, and then it begins to matter. It begins to matter when when people um, bring their sister parish from Uganda to the U.S. for a protracted visit and house people in their own homes, or go to another part of the world to meet their their counterparts in a different place and have real face to face encounters about their thoughts, hopes, dreams, struggles, realities as they um, exist framed inside their Christian communities and in their w- larger realities and start to enter into the complexities of them mm-hmm. in new ways that couldn't be done from behind a desk or by reading books. Mm-hmm. That's not the end of the story. Milbank and I are incidental. If that gets into the level of, if that affects people who are leading congregations, so priests, ministers, pastors, and they then start fomenting this kind of relationality among those in there who come into their ecclesial groupings. That's, that's the dream. Mm-hmm. That's, that's, that would be the, the way in which this actually diffuses throughout the way in which we do Christianity. I, I agree with you. I don't think that um, certainly, you know, the, the people who I grew up with, will read a book like this and say, I now have a completely renovated notion of what it means to be a Christian disciple. It just isn't going to work that way. Yeah. But it does work that way if we train leaders for the church who are sensitive to the fact that the church is not the end game here mm-hmm. um, and a social justice program is not the end game here. Being the agent of God for a new order of reality in God's own creation and in the hearts of human beings is the end game here. Yeah. That's a different thing. Well, one of the things that popped up in my mind when reading it, you talk a bit, um, and well, not a bit, uh, a significant amount about the vocation of the church, the mission of the church, and that kind of thing. And, and I was thinking how the after the Reformation, discussion of like vocation and stuff was about the individual. And yes. uh, the and not in like a mean way, like an individual's vocation. It was actually empowering the church to recognize the the, the sacredness, the 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 depth of being who you are at your place with your work, your family, and your situatedness in the world. That's um, right. And a a lot of the kind of ecumenical movements and stuff uh, have these turns towards the vocation of the church, uh, and and I wonder like how you see that tension playing out, because uh, short of like some, let's say, second half of life, to, you could probably have margin of time in your life to really connect to the church with a level of intentionality and mm-hmm. stuff, especially because of the economic system. I don't think it's like people are just selfish or whatnot. That it's second half of life before um, people, at least in larger numbers, will have the time to attend to uh, the church's vocation and this kind of stuff. Um, now, I think that's one means we should probably like actually give elders back their role and uh, and that kind of thing. Um, but uh, that's hard to do when you, me, our youth experience was uh, silo, right? Like, yeah. how many times are we in worship? How many friends do we have that aren't four years? older or younger than us and we leave the church we have to reconnect and it's the first time we've worshiped with a 80 year age range so um but but i do think there's something powerful about the church connecting its vocation to each one of us in our own vocations yes and how what does that look like eschatologically um because you give these really five really i thought a really good description of the five marks of an eschatological ecclesiology tensiveness openness risk trust hope and like I could imagine rewriting all that section and then turning it towards the individual as yes. well. And that being the spiritual formation of the churches, what is it like to practice your vocation with? Right. And I think that for, for me, that's exactly the key because mm-hmm. the communion that I'm talking about doesn't exist in a, in, in a monadic form. It's not about the individual. And I think that you're right. The Protestant turn to the individual had everything to do with the rise of I mean, I'll put my cards on the table with the rise of market capitalism, mm-hmm. right? I mean, it has everything to do with the um, with the rise of the merchant class and the middle class, and about the need to uh, make your way in the world in a particular um, proto consumerist culture that's setting up 
worldly success as an analog to salvation, and that that is precisely why we also get eschatology reduced to what happens to me after I die. Right. And that, and that was not the vision of the, of the early church. The vision of the early church is what happens to this creation when God ushers it into its fulfillment? And how is my destiny wrapped up in that greater destiny? And that's another way in which the church can be doing a better job saying there is no salvation for us outside of the salvation of the whole. There is no, um, there is no eschaton without the creation to which the eschaton is oriented. Mm -hmm. There is no church without the world in which that church is embedded as an agent of God's coming future in it. As a result, individual Christian folks can't live out their vocations in whatever sector of the world in which they're doing that without that being a relational reality. It's not just about me and Jesus. It's not just about my faith walk. It's not just about um, whether I've, not, I've accepted Jesus as my personal Lord and Savior, though those things are crucial. They're important. But that's one side of, of a much larger reality in which your relationship with Jesus is only fleshed out in the way in which that's instantiated in the relationship with your neighbor mm -hmm. and in the relationship with your uh, fellows in the wider world. And so um, how do you create an ecclesiology of communion or how do you understand the church as a relational reality in a world that is striving to, uh, especially in the American context where individualism is the prime driver of identity. Mm -hmm. That's the counter. That is the, I think, countercultural move that Christianity really stands for. It's the communal, um, the recapturing of a communitarian spirit of the common good and of my good, my individual good being embedded in that common good that our everything from our media culture to our, um, our music, our arts, our, uh, our, our literature is striving to tell us is not true. That's not the case. And so the church's job is to get us thinking, I think, uh, again, back to Jamie Smith about desire. What do we desire? That it's desiring God's kingdom rather than desiring um, what the larger society tells us is actually important. And I know that that starts to, to verge into a certain it could sound in people's ears like a certain kind of sectarianism or, or withdrawal, and that's not what I mean. I mean it's well, deeper. One of the things that you do differently than him, or it could just be my one experience him with negative, so I, I like you. Um, uh, audio, audio, audio biographical asides with Trip Fuller. Um, <laughs> what is uh, the, uh, the flip side of desire that, um, that is there is uh, de desires also... Uh, uh, created, whether you're aware of it or not, by prohibitions. You know, Paul talks about this. Yes. Um, but it's also created by uh, um, testimonies about you. And, yes. and market culture, testimonies about you, essentially your lack. And yes. so in being told that we lack good looks, uh, success, yep. th then we, our desires are created by, I need this to fulfill X, Y, and Z. Yes. Um, if you are a, a nerd and you know that l last week was uh, Force Friday and all the new Episode 7 Star Wars Legos were released and uh, your desire was outsourced to your seven-year-old son and you were like, let's just look and see what's there. And, uh, and you realize that other parents had skipped school in the morning and already bought them all at Target. Holy crap. Before you went after you dropped them off. But just to say, like, they're... Like, Desire, like, when we're tending to desires, I know a lot of people, because of, like, Protestant, Calvinist, kind of puritanical guilt stuff, they're like, oh, obsessing, you know, stabbing desires, just a bunch of yeah. guilt tripping, blah, blah, blah. But I think the bigger picture is to go, no, 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 um, the eschatological imagination is one that, first off, reveals the desires you already have and that are determining you. You see yourself as having, as lack. Yes. And that, that lack creates desires that are destructive to the planet, the poor, yourself, the family, yep. the relationships you have, and all those things. And in fact, it's telling you a word about yourself that's not even true. Because the right. true word, the gift, the gospel is you yes. are God's beloved. 
And guess yes. what? You don't have to and, reform or do anything. That's right. And then you start to operate as a Christian from a deficit model rather than from an asset model. So right. that you're, you're always, you're always saying, uh, um, what do I not have or what is at risk here that I might be losing? And, the, and then the question, and that's where the question of authority starts coming in. Who's calling the shots in the church? Who is, who is telling us how things should be? Am I willing to risk have, being in relationship with my fellow Christians in such a way that I'm trusting them to uh, be in right relationship with me all the while understanding that what we're really doing is laboring forward under the promise of God to bring us into a new reality where lack is not the model, superabundance is the model, and therefore we can trust one another. We Plenitude is an eschatological reality, right? Mm-hmm. And if we have a vision of plenitude, a vision of flourishing, a vision of wholeness, a vision of communion and all, and that fourfold richness that I was talking about. And that's what we're operating out of rather than a deficit model of if I give authority to my coworker in Christ over here, then I have reduced my authority to direct the church over here. Conflict is, is going to arise. Inevitably conflict is going to arise. And this is going to create a church that is less than it could be. And, and part of it, I think, is the uh, – it depends on your personality, but sometimes it's not um, possession of something that gets you – or competing, it's competition. Like yes. it's tr- – like part of giving someone the ability to speak into your life prophetically or upliftingly or whatever means that you are risking being vulnerable. Um, and when your identity worth value is determined by something external to you, um, apart from the image of God that you bear that was there the moment you woke up um, right. as a human being, um, then sometimes we compete for stuff, but sometimes we compete for power Yes, uh, in relationships, which I think is the bigger one when it goes to churches, right? Like you rarely, like you can have a fight about church money, but the fight about money is usually about power, like who it is that's deciding what is there. Yes. Sometimes it's about uh, possessions, but most of the time it's power or prestige, Yes. And, and my worry about community ecclesiology is that the way that it gets deployed is about keeping it as often and anx- it comes out of an anxiety about keeping power as centrally located in, quite frankly, Western, educated, wealthy spheres of influence as possible. Mm-hmm. And, that, and that that was the present one of the um, things that one of the troubling aspects of what you could see coming out of the Anglican communion in the wake of the Gene Robinson issue in terms of the commissions that were set up to investigate how does the church maintain its communion when there is this kind of controversy and conflict. And the response to that was you tighten the reins in many ways. And my reaction is to to that was to write this book and say, no, it is that you disperse, you disperse authority even more widely than it's already dispersed because it's relationality that is going to help us be what we are called to be as disciples of Jesus, not a, not an exercise of power and authority. It's mm-hmm. giving away authority. It's Pauline weakness that's going to, that's going to uh, create us into disciples um, on the earth, not um, lording it over our others. Mm-hmm. Yeah. I, I'm, I, I realize that four fifths of all my questions we haven't got to, and now we're we're nearing the end of time. So <laughs> maybe I'll, I'll I'll let you pick what it is you want to talk about next. But before I just want to say, um, everyone should go check out the book More Than Communion, T and T Clark, um, and you should probably definitely ask your library to get it because it's a substantive uh, purchase. Um, yeah. Until they get inspired to make the like paperback or e version, it um, will be in paperback in about a year ish. Awesome. So, well, then make sure you email me so I can remind people that it's I there. Will. Uh, the, the, uh, the middle chapter, the church in the world, uh, eschatological imagination, was my favorite, the description of grammar. This is what I, this is, if I was just talking to you not on the podcast, here would be my question. Um, okay. So in your description of eschatological grammar, you have like the kind of attentiveness to the way eschatology functions in the Christian tradition um, kind of thing that... Uh, um, is all like, uh, you know, like post-liberals will like it. Um, the shape of life Wittgenstein type thing. 
You mm-hmm. also have um, the uh, prophetic shape of eschatological uh, thought uh, Metz, Moltmann kind of points yeah. out, right? Like mm-hmm. that eschatological shape is not just the shape of language that creates the form of life that's the church. It's also right. uh, the uh, energetic impulse or the uh, prism through which God's future critiques and threatens what already is the case, be it Absolutely. church structures, nation state, capitalism, all, um, or our own habits, addictions, lives, patterns, right. relating, personal, all the way to the macro. Um, That's right. And then you have this interesting discussion on the relationship of eschatology to history, where you um, you critique Milbank wonderfully, um, and 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 here's what here's what I'm wondering. I read it and I thought, well, which image of God is functioning here eschatologically? So, like, one is kind of a more traditional one, where the transcendence of God is like above and down, and uh, then. Uh, and, and so, like, eschatological events are mm-hmm. uh, kind of these divine invasions, interruptions type things, and they're events that prom- they're promissory notes. Then you have kind of like Hegel and Friends, which Moltmann and Pondenberg do different ones, where the mm-hmm. transcendent is this uh, imminent transcendence, where the surplus of eschatological possibility meets the becoming of each moment, challenges yes. it, p- draws it forth. Yes. And then you have, like, this... Uh, the transcendence of the possible. And you yes. do this reading of Pottenberg and Caputo together, and oddly enough, I thought about the relationship of that before and then never knew what to make of it because Caputo would nowhere in chance get to either of the first two images of God. Right. Like, God is not like the transcendent being, the imminent being, God's the no-being. Yeah. And poetics is a productive way of looking at the call that sometimes God is what's hinted at in it or something like that. It's yes. not productive in the sense the excess of the divine life and the gift God, who we know who the caller and source is, intends yes. to give the world, is there. Um, I'm wondering kind of how you see a work that engages a more transcendent one like Milbank, mm-hmm. uh, a more imminent one like Pondenberg and Moltmann, and then a more kind of from below rupturous mm-hmm. uh, one like Caputo. How do you imagine these eschatological events uh, connecting. Does that make sense? That oh, makes perfect sense. Thank you so much for that. I, I think... And the half way the I, people just turned it off, but the ones that haven't are like, yeah, I want to know that. I'm going to yes. get the book. Thank you for staying with us, you people. Um, I, I think that... Um, I think that what I'm trying to do there, I mean, not to be too precious about it, is to affirm three those very three things Mm -hmm. the transcendence of god the imminence of god and the openness of god right so that so that god is transcendent to time and history as creator Mm -hmm. i don't think that god is i i I take a bit of an exception to caputo though i defer to caputo on on, he defers about everything (laughs) perpetually (laughs) you like that jack Ah, yeah, you're welcome, Jack. That is a good one. You're a- I love that. Um, and so I, I, I do want to maintain that it, it, it makes sense to me in the way that my, my theological furniture is arranged to understand God as creator, as, as transcendent to creation, and therefore present to creation in love. And so there is that. I also think, on the other hand, that is what you just uh, very well put your finger on, that there is surplus in those, emo- in, in those moments of rupture. They're, they're the um, they're creation coming to apprehend its created purpose, right, for communion with its creator. Mm-hmm. So there's a way in which there's an Aquinian, there's an Aquinian move going on there in some ways and but the the way you phrase it there the teleology of it is not a uh natural teleology correct because and that's which would be the critique of kind of hegel and such that's right and that's where the openness comes in god has created a creation that's free to create itself i think the evolutionary biology and um the uh the radical contingency of history um on both of those aspects of reality, one on the biological level, one on the on sort of the human and sociological level, point to the fact that our world, our reality, our cosmos, this can be 
projected out into the cosmic level as well. These processes are radically open, radically contingent, radically free under the constraints that God has given. However, there's promise that undergirds it all. And that creates a framework, I think, in which these arisings can take place. And so you do have a history that is um, that has these moments of, of inbreaking, but they're not predetermined moments. And, they're, and those moments of history didn't have to be. That's our work in creating them with the creator. Mm-hmm. You see what I mean? and, so, and so I do think that all of that is happening at the same time. And that what undergirds the whole thing, what unifies the whole thing, what sort of shores up the whole structure is promise. Mm-hmm. That, that, that God as creator and redeemer has promised that there will be the communion of that creation with God and God's self and, and with an internal creation, a coherent uh, communion inside the, the, the creation that God loves and wishes to bring to fulfillment, not restoration, but to fulfillment. And that that's always new, that that's unanticipatable. That's part of the, um, that's the reason why eschatological imagery remains poetic, that there's no way to specify in advance what eschatology consists of, only that there is a promise, only that Jesus' resurrection secures a promise um, of God to fulfill relational perfection. Mm-hmm. But how that occurs, we participate in that, and the creation itself is engaged in that. And, and one of the things that um, I, I think is is important for people to catch, and I, I, I got a rather interesting email from someone that was reading my book, and and they emailed me back and like, I never got this. Do you really believe this? Yeah, and and it, there and one of the lines in the book is something about like, what's up for grabs when you go to eschatology and resurrection stuff like that is not us. It's whether God is who God said God is. Yes, and it's it's. It, it, the resurrection or the promise of the resurrection, the gift of the divine life to all the world uh, is not about us, just like the kingdom of God is not about us. That's right. It's about God being the one true good God of Israel. Correct. And um, so a lot of times when we over-realize our eschatology or over-mythologize it or whatever you end up doing, um, uh, theologically it can appear like you are just giving up on God. Yes. I agree. Because God gave that, up on history. That's exactly what's at stake, I think. What's exa- that's exactly what's at stake in giving up on a bodily resurrection. I, I, I believe in the Pauline attestation that if Christ is not raised, then our faith is in vain and we are most to be pitied. I, I think that that is absolutely right because it is the, the seal of the promise in the resurrection of the one who was condemned precisely for perfectly instantiating the very communion toward which this creation is headed and God's overturning of that by the resurrection that seals in promise that all creation is headed toward the kingdom of God that Jesus came preaching. Mm -hmm. And so if that is just a myth, if that is in, in, in the pejorative sense, not in the fruitful sense of myth, but if that is just a poetic image for something that we can claim is Jesus being resurrected into the community or, or the, the continuation of God's mission on earth past the earthly life of the, of the man who came proclaiming it, that's not good enough. Theologically, that's not good enough. We need, it, the, the bodily resurrection is the, is the, is the, um, the great mystery that is the seal of that promise. You would say it's not good enough to sustain Christian theology. It could be good enough, right, as a philosophical explanation of yes. the Christian religion or yes. of the uh, uh, social evolutionary trajectory of religion or whatever. That's right. But again, like this is why I have found your biography at the beginning so interesting. Like if you were already Joseph Campbelling it and Jungianing it up, um, there's some sense in which uh, you don't need an enemy to Christianity when your friends are really into it, but ignore like the whole beginning part, like God raised a homeless dead dude and that was the promise for the world. Yep. And, and, and to me, going back to the biography, that's eschatology was my way back in, in a deep way because of the fact that 
it made sense to me for the first time. It made sense for me for the first time, the Christian proclamation and what's unique about the Christian proclamation and the Christian vision. Um, in a way that went beyond the Jungian analysis of, of, of Christianity as yet another instantiation of the impulse toward transcendence of the mm-hmm. human person. It's more than that. If that is all that it, if, if for, for me, for speaking as a theologian, if that's all it is, you're right. You're quite right. The resurrection as a, as something that's embodied and real and, and real in the philosophical sense or the ontological sense can be done away with. But in a, on a theological level, to make sense of the Christian proclamation as we live it out and as it animates a way of being together and as we imagine the future that, that God has in store, the unimaginable future, as we imagine the unimaginable, impossible possibility of God's future, then that is what we need. We yeah. need that resurrection grammar to condition those attestations, those assertions. Well. Uh, Nay, next time your next book is more than archetypes. And, That's right. Uh, <laughs> uh, exactly. Because so. I think that's a helpful way. Because it's not like a dismissal of it. It's just no. There are plenty of explanatory discourses, philosophers of religion, philosophical theologians engage in and reflecting on um, yes. uh, the religious phenomena, the experience, history, and all that. Um, it's just if you're a theologian. There's also one way, a perspective of seeing it, which is namely as God's self testimony uh, right. in whatever way that means. Correct. Um, yeah. So, uh, anyway, thank you tons for joining us. Thank you tons for having me. Oh, definitely. Yeah.